by the time Columbus got here in 1492, see, people have many opinions about him, who he was or what he was, but whatever, see, he was really like the virus. <laughs> you know? And it, the, the spirit was being eaten by disease, and it affected the perceptional reality of the human. See, so when Columbus and him got here, and we told them who we were, they didn't know. <laughs> we said, well, we're the people, we're the human beings. But they didn't know because it wasn't a part of their perceptional reality. <laughs> the concept was no longer a part of their perceptional reality. See, this is what happened to the tribes of Europe and the descendants of the tribes of Europe. And so I know that by the time Columbus got here, and I, I got a pretty good idea way before that, but, but by the time Columbus got here, the idea of a human being and people in that kind of a way was no longer a part of their perceptional reality. And, and, and we will look at, but what did, what did Columbus come out of? See, when he got here, this hemisphere had no protection to this disease because it had never been here like that. <laughs> so there was no immune system to the disease as it moved because the disease came through the wind and the water. So it was airborne in a way and water carried. So it just took the shape of a man rather than something you can't see. But it arrived. Right? And this spirit that was being eaten, which made this diseased perception of reality. So by the time Columbus got here, all right, let's look about, about 1100 A.D. or 1000 A.D., the church made the decision that it was God's government. It was the authority of God on earth, so it was God's government. And at that time, the descendants of the tribes of Europe no longer remembered that they, were, that they come from tribes. This wasn't really a part of their conscious reality. Because by 1000 AD, see, they had been owned by, <laughs> they'd been owned for many, many, many generations by, by whoever claimed ownership of the land and started owning the land. And then they became, they became fiefs and they became uh, serfs and they became peasants. So they really had no reality about being a part of the tribe anymore because they were just the property that was owned like whoever the landlord was or the royalty at any given time that owned that land or claimed that land. They belonged to that land like all of the other natural resources of the land. But they still prayed to spirits. See, they still, the women still had a, a, a stronger role yet from the old tribal way, and they still prayed to spirits. So the church, by 1000 AD or 1100 AD, it decided that it was now going to mine this resource. I mean, save the souls of the heathen, see. So the church created the Inquisition, and basically the Inquisition was, number one, is it was to change the perceptional reality of the descendants of the tribes of Europe. All right? And so they were terrorized and brutalized for 500 years in order to do this. But, but the way the church rationalized this was they were going to save, they wanted to possess the souls of the heathens and the pagans. See, they wanted to possess their souls in the name of, of their Lord. All right, so th this war was to, about possessing the souls of the descendants of tribes of Europe. And in order to possess their souls, they had to alter their perceptional reality. So if you thought differently than the church wanted you to think, bingo, you were, you were killed. And you were tortured and your property was taken. And if somebody accused you, basically you were guilty if you were accused. You don't know, incidentally, during the torturing process, you'd probably say somebody else's name. So now somebody else is going to kind of... So they killed as efficiently as they possibly could with the technology they had at hand at the time. And they did it for 500 years. By the time Columbus got here, it had been going on for 400 years. And by, so by the time Columbus got here, let's say 20 years to a generation, just for the lifespan during that time frame. All right? So by the time Columbus got here, the descendants of the tribes of Europe had been through 20 generations of having their spirit just completely attacked and the way this possessed thing kind of just seems to manifest itself so they became spiritually and physically now the possession of something else see then it, before that it was just physically now they had become spiritually the possession of someone else see, so they had no clarity about reality so by the time Columbus got here See, they didn't know what it meant to be a human being anymore. It was just not a part of their spiritual, perceptional relationship to reality. They were possessed, they were owned, they were property. 
You know, and, and one of the other things about this that kind of evolved out of that, I think it evolved out of that, was anyway, when the church was doing all of this to get the descendants of the tribes of Europe, all right, they, they finally figured out, well, hold it, if I want to stay alive and be a descendant of anything, I'm going to have to accept these people. <laughs> so they embraced the church because they had to embrace what they feared. So they had to love what they feared in order to survive. And what they had to love, the thing that they had to love that they feared was possessing them. So it's like love and fear and possession as a perceptual reality be kind, of, kind of became intertwined at that time and the human beings have not been able to sort it out yet. So that affected everyone in some kind of a way that's not been healthy for us as human beings. So anyway, anything and all of these things that have happened to us through our generational evolution has been a learning experience and has been a part of our evolutionary experience. See, but I think that we're in the right time. <laughs> we're in the right place at the right time, even if we don't quite get it. Yeah, I, I don't think that we're here. There's a reason we're here. We're here at the time for us to be here. That's why us and the lives that we have lived that brought us to this place and that we will live when we leave this place. There's a reason that we're here. And part of it is, I know we're here at the right time and we're in the right place. It's just, how, how are we going to start perceiving reality? You know, and that's just really where it starts to, it starts to become more clear. Out of self-respect, we owe it to ourselves. Out of respect of self, we owe it to the selves of others, you know, to be, let's use our intelligence as intelligently as we can, as often as we can, right? It's not even saying all the time, but maybe we get there someday. To understand, you know, there are moments in our lives, there are times in our lives when coherency would probably be the best thing to do, <laughs> you know, before one deals with what's there in front of them. Because a part of the, what this confusion that I call that this pollution that's left over in our perceptual reality, see, has got to do is they don't want us to think. Okay, this is the deal. Whoever this miner is, <laughs> the way this thing works, they don't want us to think. I mean, I didn't really understand it. I knew this, but I didn't understand it. I knew this a long time ago because at one point when I realized somewhere along the way that there was like these 17,000 pages of stuff on me, right? And I thought... Hold it here, what did I do, you know? Because I know what I did, <laughs> you know? So I know this was, I know how I participated. And just once it sunk into me about all of this had been done around someone like me, right? And it made me think, well, I understand what they fear now. I mean, I know what they fear. I know their paranoia. Because sometimes I can be coherent. See, and they, they don't like that. Right? They don't like it when I'm coherent in front of people because then we're coherent together. See, whether we agree with one or another or not isn't the point. They just don't want us to be coherent individually or together. Right? And so that's really what I figured out. This is why they have to have people spying on people and they got to do all because they don't want us thinking. They don't want us thinking. I mean, in the hypothetical, <laughs> some kind of dream. Well, I don't even know if this is a dream. This, but if we all, if every human being woke up tomorrow morning and said, all right, I will not enable what I know to be the lie <laughs> all day today, it would change. <laughs> it could not function. If every human being got up tomorrow and said, I will not enable it, I will not participate in the lie today, it would change. See, but that's not going to happen in, the, in our lifetime, right? Well, I don't know. I should never say never. But I don't see it. <laughs> but anyway, about us being in the right place and in the right time, because in our place in the evolution, it's how we use our intelligence that says, because no one can control what's going to happen, even those in authority, they can't control it. They've got us intimidated and they've distorted our perceptional realities, all right, so that we don't see as clearly as we should. But no one can really control it. But what we can do and what we will do all right, is we will influence the evolution. We will influence if we use our intelligence as clearly and coherently as we can, as often as we can, then the evolutionary future will be more clear and coherent for us. If we use it pretending to think, but we're not really thinking because, you know, then that means the future 
the evolutionary future will be unclear and unthinking. See, this is the participation. This is the, because this is the power relationship we have to reality. Just like an earthquake has, you know, an earthquake or a tornado. We're, remember now, we are shapes of the earth. And we have consciousness and we have being. We have essence. So it's like we're drops of rain, you know. And enough drops of rain get together, you know, and you, get a little, you can make a real storm. And the authoritarian system has to adjust to the storm. They can't find it or indict it. They can't, you know. <laughs> you know? When it snows, the next time you get shut in in Chicago, remember your relationship to power because you're a snowflake. All right? And once we understand our relationship to power, then, then this other thing that is the wind, this other thing, right, it appears. Whether we, it works individually or collectively. But see, but we have to understand to use our intelligence because this is our create. And how good, how good are we at creating with our intelligence? Then let's look at our own personal dark sides and the things that give us our fears and our doubts. This is how good we can use our creative ability. This is how effectively we could use it.